And I'm the creator of a project called LTNS. LTNS is a CLI tool for solving complex translation workflow and complex formatting, which is mostly what my talk will be about. Let's go through the structure of this talk. I will have demos of problems and solutions regarding I18N. I think it's important for people to understand the problem before they see a solution, especially in the I18N subject because many dev developers tend to be naive and think that I18N is not a problem, when in fact it is. And it's usually not until they see a demonstration of a problem where they recognize a problem being a problem. My presentation will be divided into two parts, one part explaining complex translation formatting and the other part explaining I18N workflow. And at the end of this talk, I will publish my tool to NPM. So let's begin with part one, complex translation work formatting. I will talk about CLDR and ICU's message format, plural formatting, context-based formatting, and number formatting, and date formatting. So let's begin with pluralization. What we see here is a very common mistake people make when dealing with pluralization. We have blocks of code where the execution is dependent on a locale. So we have if locale equals zhcn, else if locale equals en.us, and then we have blocks of code inside those if statements. And this is bad. It makes me want to cry. Because we have local dependent code blocks. And it's bad because a translator needs to depend on a programmer to translate anything. And it's also bad because a programmer needs to know local specific data, which in the pluralization case means plural remembering or memorizing plural rules. And remembering plural rules for one or two locales might be fine, but try to remember plural rules for three or more which is very hard. And having locale specific code blocks just makes your uh, code base much more complex. So how do we solve this problem? Or how do we make people not crying over their code base? First I'm explaining, like what is CLDR, what does it stand for, and why is it useful? CLDR stands for Common Locale Data Repository. Its data is used as a helper for localizing strings. And it's maybe the largest repository in the world, if not the only. And it's used by Apple, Google, IBM, Yahoo, etc. Here's some example data taken from CLDR. And in the first XML tag, we see plural rules, and it defines a number of languages, and one of them is English. And inside the XML tag plural rules, we have other plural rules or plural forms that is defined inside there. So let's move on to plural forms. In spoken English, we just have two defined plural forms, namely singular and plural. Uh, the plural rule for singular is one, and the plural form of plural rule for plural is everything but one. But because we have languages such as Arabic, Arabic have six plural forms, so CLDR needs to define up to six plural forms. And they are called, they are names of plural form now, and they are called zero, one, two, few, many, and other. So try to remember it. Zero, one, two, few, many, another. Because it will be most likely be used in any future I18N library out there. Why is that? CLDR, CLDR's plural form is becoming de facto standard to use. Uh, 
uh, and it's used already by the iOS SDK and Android SDK. That means iOS developers and Android developers needs to know this plural forms, zero, one, two, few, many, and other. And I think so does you as a JavaScript developer. Try to remember it, zero, one, two, few, many, and other. And the plural form zero, one, two does not necessarily correspond to the numbers zero, one, two. Here is some example of plural forms. Like for English, the CLDR defines the plural form one another. For the Arabic language, CLDR defines zero, one, two, few, many, and other. For Chinese, we just have other. For French, we have one another. And remember that the plural form zero, one, two does not necessarily correspond to the numbers zero, one, two. And French is a good example of that, where the plural form one correspond to the numbers zero and one, and not just one. So that is CLDR plural form. Let's move on to ICU's message format. But before we move on to something more specific like ICU message format, let's talk about message format in general in JavaScript. We do message format using two methods in JavaScript. We have string concatenation and template strings. And I think everyone is familiar with this. But this kind of message format is only used for like trivial things, like string interpolation. And it's not suitable for something complex like plural format thing. And that is where ICU's message format comes in. ICU stands for International Components for Unicode, and it's written in C++ and Java. ICU's message format is a component in ICU for handling message strings. And here's an example of plural format. The markup begins with a curly bracket and ends with a curly bracket. And we pass in a variable, which is the counter. And in, in this example, it's called likes. The second argument is the type of formatting, which is plural in the pluralization case. And in the third, you can see, we need to define some sub-messages that corresponds to each plural form. And for the English, we need to define at least two sub-messages because there are two plural forms, one another. But this syntax looks a little bit complex and very difficult to grasp at first time. Uh, I will try to, to explain my best that this syntax is near optimal because try to define a simple syntax using at least one variable, which is the counter, the type of formatting. And then you need sub-messages for each plural form. And if you think a little bit, you will end up something like this, which is quite what we wanted. It's quite optimal also. And for Arabic language, we needed to find some messages for six plural forms and not just two. So I'm gonna do a live demo now. I will open the editor of my choice and I got some code already ready here. I'll just hit save. And then I need to run the command. It's called LTNS update. I'll open the translation interface to translate this. Uh, I will explain the code here. We require some localization strings and then we set set it to use the locale en.us, uh, en-us. And the L function call here is just a localization string getter. And then we will output the message. So it's very simple. Okay, so let's go to the translation interface. I will just go into the translation I want to translate and it will begin with the starting curly bracket and ends with the curly bracket. I'll pass in the variable likes 
and then the type of formatting, which is plural. And then I need to define a sub message for each plural form, and the plural form one and other. And the string I wanted to translate was, I like X blog post. So I will type in, I like square blog post. And then square blog post. I will just hit save. Go back to my terminal and then compile the translation with LTNS compile. Now I need to test if it works or not. So we'll just run the example. Just know the index. I like 10 blog posts and it ends with the S, so that works. I will try to, instead of 10 likes, we have just one. I like one blog post. So the pluralization works. So let's go back to the presentation. So that was plural format. Let's move on to select format. The use case for select formats is context-based formatting. And what is that? An example is X likes this conference where X is substituted with he, she, or they. He likes this conference, she likes this conference, or they likes this conference. And this is how the syntax looks like for select format. And it starts with the curly bracket and ends with the curly bracket. We input a variable, and the second argument takes a select keyword for select format. And then we need to define some messages for each case. And here's an example of uh, gender context-based formatting. We pass in the variable gender, and then we define, for the case male, we define the sub-message he. For the case female, we define the sub-message she. And for all other, just they. So that is select format. Let's move on to number format. This is how ICU defines number format. It's quite familiar with the other formats for markup. Uh, starts with curly brackets and then with curly brackets, we pass in a variable of type number. And then the second argument is the type of formatting, which is number. And the third argument, we have uh, a couple of options. In the first example, we have something called a decimal pattern. And you can see it's with squares and zeros there. And I won't, won't go into detail what, how to define your decimal pattern or how it works. You can check out the docs at the internet to see how it works. But if you don't want to define your decimal pattern, you can just use some keywords like integer, percent, promilla to define like integer format you want. And before I came here, I was checking out Airbnb's website to see if there was something good to stay at. And I noticed that their price tag, if you look at the symbol there, currency symbol, it's with a super element. Uh, and this is a perfect use case for using decimal pattern in number format. You wrap the currency symbol, uh, it's with an O and four legs with super element. And then when we compile it, it will have that HTML elements. So that is number format. Let's move on to date format. This is how ICU defines date format. And it's quite familiar. We have variable and date. Date defines the type of formatting. And the third argument is just a date pattern. Uh, the date pattern is quite intuitive. Y is for years, MMM is for month, DD for days, and so on. And I won't go into detail because the date pattern have a long specification. So you can like do whatever date format you want. It's very flexible. 
Let's move on to part two, translation workflow. I will talk about syncing translation keys, translator and programmer workflow, and translation key naming. In the left, we have storage, which in this example is a JSON file. And in the right, we have the source code. Uh, and in order for them to work, they must be synced. The storage must have the, the translation keys that the source code has. If not, they won't work. We usually do this syncing manually. And when we do it manually, that means when you delete a key in your source, you need to delete it from storage. When you add a key in your store, source, you need to add it in your so uh, storage. When you change a key in your source, you need to change it in your storage. And that's a hell. I mean, just explaining it is a hell. So most projects stay out of sync because of that. How can we fix it? We can fix it with something called auto-sync. What is that? So when you delete a key in your source, it will delete it from the storage. When you add a key in your source, it will add it in your storage. When you change a key in your source, it will migrate to the new key. But in order for auto sync to work, we need some kind of workflow. And you already seen some part of it. You write your source code, and then you update your translation keys. You tell a translator to translate it or you can translate it yourself. Then you compile your translation, and then you just run your application, and you're done. So let's have a demo of AutoSync. I will go back to Sublime, and I will define a new message now. And it's called demo AutoSync. I will demo the bad part first. Uh, in this folder, we have the storage. You can see this JSON file. But this JSON file just have one entry for the key demo plural. And the index.js is my source file. We just had demo plural at the beginning. I just added demo out of sync. But in order for it to work, I must add demo auto sync in my storage. And that means going through each file and add it in here. Whoops. And then, yeah, type it manually. And go, not just do it for one file, but all these files. And that's a help. And, but with LTNS, you just, wait, we must hit save here first. With LTNS, we can just run the command LTNS update. And you can see that it added the translation key, demo auto sync. And we can check the storage to see if it's added there. You can see demo auto sync here in set HCN. Are you, are you, demo auto sync, JJP have auto, demo auto sync, and all of this file have demo auto sync now. But let's say that we want to remove demo auto sync. Remove it here. Then if we did it manually, we need to remove this entry in all of these storage files. And that's a help. But with LTNS, you just do LTNS update and it will work. Hopefully. Yeah. So it removed that entry. Demo auto sync is not there, just demo plural. 
you can check all these files, there is no demo or sync anymore. And finally, to the migration part. Let's say you want to change this translation key. You don't think, think it's a fit. Like, I want to change this translation key to demo plurals with an S at the end. If you change this key, then you need to go through each of the storage files and change it with an S at the end. And you need to do it for all these files. And that's also a help. But with LTNS, you just hit save and then LTNS update. And it will tell me the key, demo plural, is now gone in source. What do you want to do with it? We have two options. Migrate to the new or delete it. And in this case, we want to migrate to the new one. So back to the presentation. So that was demo of AutoSync. Let's talk about translator and programmer workflow. Try to always store the English translation when you do your development. Because then the translator can relate to the English translation all the time and let the translator learn about ICU's message format because they will use it in any future product, project. And it's very easy to learn ICU's message format. And have a web translation interface available for them at all time to ease your workflow. Let's talk about translation key naming. Don't use English text as translation keys because you will have namespace issues and not, it's not future-proof. What I recommend instead is defining a sort of content structure. You can see we have a Facebook as an example. I just put the feed is in the center and then we have a side menu here and we namespace it with double underscore. We namespace feed and then the label name. For side menu, it's side menu underscore and then the label name. This makes it more scalable. So that is translation workflow. So let's move on to the launch. I will just cd into the project. PM publish. <clears throat> and it will take a while. Uh, let me just go through some relevant links. For LTNS, you just go to ltns.org. You can check out the docs also there. For ICU, you have the link here. Site icuproject.org and CLDR. So thank you for listening. Thank you. How's the NPM publish going on? Yay, Yay. it's published. So go ahead, 1.0.0, NPM yeah. install L10NS. Any questions from Tingan? Yes. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering about if you could describe a bit the web interface that you would have people use for translation and also how that works with auto sync. Okay. And also possibly having multiple developers and or translators working on the same code base. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I will go to the translation interface. You just have a home button. And it will list in chronicle order, uh, when you run LTNS update, it will list the latest here. So this is just having demo plural, but if we add more, it will list it in chronicle order. And you can search here. I like, wait, I don't know why it's not. 
quickly because I haven't put it up. Well, it's, everyone can like, if programmer is gonna work with programmer on this, then you will just commit, like if you're using Git, you just commit your translation in the storage and then just pass it on up. And it will be good like if you have a staging server and just run LTNS sync based on that staging server. And when you need someone, need to translate something, you just ask your translator to translate through the web interface in the staging server. So that kind of workflow, I think, is the best. Give a round of applause to Ting An. Thank you so much. Thank you.